Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, for this workshop on consent issues in data sharing. My name is Hina, and I work as a senior research data officer uh, within the research data management team, and we are based at University of Essex. This session includes presentations, uh, oh, sorry, presentation, and you will get the slides after the session, as I already mentioned. I will be using Mentimeter throughout the session. Uh, which can be accessed um, using a uh, numerical code or QR code. I will uh, give the code once uh, uh, you need to use it. And um, you can use the Mentimeter on your mobile. And I will use a Padlet for some assessment for an activity that uh, assesses consent form statements at the end. I will give you the link uh, in the end when we are up to that point. So the overall aim of this session is to show you the role of informed consent in sharing data within ethical and legal boundaries. I aim to cover the following in this session. Uh, for example, in the first section, I will talk you through why to seek consent. And um, this section will focus on introducing the use of informed consent forms in uh, research. And the second part of the session is about how consent can be obtained covering documentation and methods that are used to obtain consent. And uh, finally, how to manage the obtained consent forms. This is then followed by a section on when consent could be sought during the research process. And uh, some of the important aspects that uh, needs to be considered uh, are also discussed. Final section focuses on sharing with you some of the words uh, or wordings used in consent forms by the researchers and example consent forms and information sheet. And I will finish it off by highlighting some best practice tips and resources that can be useful for you um, if you are interested in data sharing. And as I said, I'll respond to your questions in the end. So, the first section, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, is about why we seek consent. So before I begin, if you would like to join Mentimeter by going to menti.com, and uh, you, as I said earlier, you can access it through your phone. You can just switch on your uh, switch on the camera on your mobile phone and scan this QR code. It will take you to the website, and then you can use this code to access the questions. Yeah, so the code is here and uh, QR code as well. I'll leave it for a few seconds. I can see people are joining. There is a comment mind blowing. Thank you. So yeah, just um, a quick questions, a quick introduction to your background, if you would like. It's anonymous. So. If you would like to give a quick introduction to your background, for example, if you are a postgraduate, early career researcher, or a professional services staff, or and so on. Just a quick intro. Business development. That's interesting. So researcher, PhD student, management, data, social researcher, So, yeah, postgraduate researcher and full time academic. Social scientist, teaching librarian, technical specialist, graduate teaching assistant. That's great. Diverse attendees, attendees with diverse backgrounds.
fantastic ethics, social scientist, audience support staff. That that is interesting, as I am also an audience support staff. Software engineer, PhD student, ethics and governance. Thank you very much. So very, uh, all of you have uh, joined today from a very diverse background. Thank you. So the next question is what type of data are you interested in or working with? So almost equal number of people are interested in qualitative or mixed methods and some with quantitative. So majority is mixed methods. That's great. And final question for now, why we seek consent in research? Any thoughts on that? Beauty of care, ethical reasons. Someone in the chat has written, it's just disappeared. Oh, okay, maybe you have joined the men Mentimeter. So ethical requirements, ethically sound, meet ethical data protection, protecting participants, maybe need to publish the results exactly, compliance with research ethics and laws. Ethical and legal reasons to ensure PIs can make informed decisions, transparency and informed consent. Yeah, that all of the responses are perfect. Respects, respect the rights of participants. Yeah. To use the data for research. Yes, that's right. To ensure participants understand what they are about to do. Yeah and what will happen with their data. Exactly, yeah, that's very important. Accountability issues, yes, that's right. Transparency is another, yeah, thing. Openness and transparency. Privacy of the participants for gatekeeping, ethical conduct protection for researchers and participants. Yes, that's, that's right. Thank you very much. for your responses and taking part in it. So coming back to the presentation, um, surely you all are very familiar with what informed consent is. So generally speaking, it is the process by which a researcher discloses appropriate information about the research um, so that a participant may make a voluntary informed choice to accept or refuse to participate um, in a research study. So in the research context, consent is obtained to ensure that participants understand what they are signing up to, making participation and research more effective. And it also ensures that the research conducted is ethical and compliant with the data protection le legislation, as you have all mentioned that. So in the research context, we need consent for two purposes. Consent for research participation, uh, which I'm sure you all are aware, uh, and which is considered as one of the founding principles of research ethics, where it is sought before participation in any research activity and from all the participants. And um, it usually involves providing information regarding study purpose, risk, benefits, voluntary participation, and so on. However, consent can also be used to comply with the data protection regulation. For example, um, if a researcher collects, manages, and share personal data, then consent of the data subject can be used as a lawful basis to process this personal information under the UK GDPR. And I will give you a brief background to uh, this uh, UK GDPR bit in 
couple of upcoming slides uh, as I think it's necessary here. So there, there are two main legal frameworks that relates to identified or identifiable individuals. Uh, and these are the common law or duty of confidentiality and data protection legislation. So in the UK, there, there is a duty of confidentiality that is based in common law and that occurs when uh, confidential information comes to the knowledge of a person in circumstances where it would be unfair if, if it were then to be disclosed to others. Uh, however, there are some exceptions when you can disclose information, for example, if participant consents to onward sharing their personal data, then sharing does not breach duty of confidentiality. And sometimes public, public interest can override uh, duty of confidentiality as well. And occasionally there are instances when you may need to give up data such as uh, when there is a court order to do so. So the best practice is to avoid very specific promises in consent forms, if, especially if you plan to share that data. And um, as researchers, uh, you must adhere to data protection requirements when managing or sharing personal data Personal data is any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And um, you, you may be aware that people can be identified directly or indirectly. And um, some examples of direct identifiers are name, address, postcode, telephone numbers, voice, pictures, while some of the examples of indirect identifiers are occupation, geography, unique or exceptional values or outliers in the data, uh, which when combined can disclose an identity of a person. So if personal information about people is collected or used in research, then the general data protection regulation, uh, UK GDPR, it does apply. But remember that if the data is anonymized, then GDPR or UK GDPR, it does not apply. A bit of a background to the GDPR is necessary here. Um, GDPR is the EU-wide data protection regulation that was introduced in 2018, and it replaced UK Data Protection Act uh, that was used until that time. However, after Brexit, Brexit. It is now called the UK GDPR. And currently, both UK GDPR and EU GDPR, they are aligned and they place the same legal obligations on researchers. And in future, these may diverge. Um, it is therefore important for researchers to ensure that they gain local support from their university DPO um, if their research project spans across the EU. So, for example, if the researcher based in the UK collects personal data about people anywhere in the world, or a researcher outside the UK collects personal data about people uh, in the UK, then DP, DPA and UK GDPR both applies. However, if the researchers, um, they are undertaking research projects which span across the EU, then uh, the EU GDPR and UK GDPR also needs to be considered and adhered to. So th th there is a misconception that data protection laws such as GDPR prohibits data sharing. However, it does not prevent data sharing as long as you approach it in a sensible and proportionate way. Um, in fact, it is useful for research because it legalizes much of the current good practice in research, such as data sharing and archiving under the UK GDPR. Um, there, there are six possible grounds uh, for processing personal data, and one of these must be present, and these are consent, public interest, legitimate interest, protection of vital interest, legal obligation, and performance of a contract. And um, in the context of research, uh, the first three, consent, public task, or legitimate interest are the most applicable grounds for processing personal data usually. So if you are using consent as a lawful base, uh, then 
may you need to make sure to fulfill certain conditions associated to it. For example, it must be freely given, it must be informed and ambiguous. It should be specific, such as if it is for audio recording, video recording, and so on. It must be a clear affirmative action, and it should not be inferred from silence, predict boxes, or any sort of inactivity. And make sure that the participants were given the opportunity to request to remove their personal data at any time. This request uh, to withdraw is for removing their data and not a withdrawal from research, which is ordinarily asked in the consent form. So that's the difference to keep in mind. And uh, it must be documented, for example, recorded, written, or oral. And finally, an explicit consent is required to process special categories data, uh, which is uh, related to race, ethnic origin, political or religious beliefs, or health data. So Information Commissioner's Office, ICO, advised that for almost all research conducted in the UK organizations should rely on either public task for all public bodies or legitimate interest for non-public bodies. However, those holding and using health information, which is a special category of personal data, uh, will also require a further condition in addition to the public task. And um, usually in academia, this is uh, to support scientific and historical research. This additional condition is being used. And in addition, you also need to complete a DP, uh, DPIA, Data Protection Impact Assessment, for any type of processing which is likely to be high risk. So you must be therefore aware of the risk of processing the special category data. So one of um, the condition is explicit content that con uh, consent that could be used, uh, additional condition if you are processing um, special category data. So a quick info on explicit consent if you are to obtain it. Um, ordinary consent can be obtained verbally or in writing. However, explicit consent should always be recorded or documented. So that's the difference. There are certain conditions that need to be adhered to. Otherwise, the consent can become invalid. So that's another difference in terms of um, explicit consent as well as if you are using consent as a local base to process personal for example, if you do not give genuine free choice or if there was a clear imbalance of power between a researcher and an individual, it, it becomes invalid. Uh, also, if the consent request was vague or unclear, if the researcher's organization was not specifically named, it becomes invalid. Subjects were not informed about their rights to withdraw and so on. So these are the things you need to keep in mind if you are obtaining explicit consent um, for your research. So, sorry, uh, explicit consent statement should uh, specifically refer to the particular data set um, that is to be processed and the precise purpose of processing including any automated decision-making should identify any risks or implications that might arise for the data subject as a result of the data process processing. And um, it should provide any other relevant and specific information that influence the decision of a data subject to give or not to give their consent. So these are some considerations if you are to obtain an ex explicit consent. And um, this slide and the couple of following slides are the screenshots of a very nice checklist from University of Dublin uh, in order to assess if your explicit consent form is in line with the UK GDPR and health research regulations. And you can see here uh, that, um, that this first section is about uh, the items or questions related to if you have uh, has the consent been freely given? Have you informed the data subject that they have the option to withdraw their consent and any time uh, if they so wish and some considerations under this section, then is the con consent specific? Is the consent informed? The consent must be unambiguous. 
automated decision making. There are some uh, questions related to that to check and a bit about international data transfer. I have added a link to this checklist um, on the slide, and then there is a guidance available from Health Research Authority on consent. I have added a link at the bottom. Um, some of you are interested in that. So apart from being good scientific practice, in some countries, gaining informed consent is mandated by law. For example, here you can see that some countries have mandatory requirement to obtain consent if you collect personal data. However, there is no legislative requirement for consent to be sought from participants in the UK. Uh, because if you remember, ICO advised um, uh, to adopt pu public interest uh, in the UK. Uh, they, they suggest to use that legal base. Uh, but funders and research ethic committees and uh, ethic, ethic guidance bodies may ask you that it is a requirement. So the next section is about how to seek consent. It includes formats to obtain consent, the documentation, methods and record keeping, some information about these issues. So, but before that, um, if you can join the Mentimeter, uh, that would be good for a couple of questions. That gives you a break to you uh, from listening to me continuously because it is intense and it's a lot of content to take in. So yeah, so this is the code or the QR code to join. I leave it for a few seconds. So uh, if you would like to share which format of consent you have used in your research, if any. Is it verbal, written, recorded? So signed forms, verbal, written. So implied in a paper form, app, so it's a mixed uh, response, written, verbal, sign, paper, e-consents, App consent obtaining consents through apps and yet yeah, signed. That's great. So obtaining consent through app or e consents would be interesting. Yep. Yeah, thank you. And have you given uh, the consent forms you have designed? Um, if you remember, because it's hard to remember what was in there, sometimes people do use the consent forms uh, suggested by their departments or universities. If you remember, have you given the opportunity to ask questions? Yeah, so that's great. Uh, majority of you remember and that you have given the opportunity to ask questions. So this is great. Someone is not sure. It's like me. I don't remember what I have put in the consent forms when I was doing my PhD. It's hard to remember. Um, and it's a couple of you, they mentioned that they have not given the opportunity to ask questions. Yeah, I can understand because usually... Uh, well, 
there, there is a comment and it just disappeared. Um, it was related to participant information sheet, but it just disappeared. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, usually we all use um, the consent forms or the participant information sheets uh, that are available from our departments or from our universities or REOs. So we are not very bothered or concerned what is in there. But as the data sharing is becoming popular and a requirement from the funders these days, so these things do matter a lot now. If you are required to share your data, either uh, it's a mandatory thing from the funder or you just want to deposit your data so that others can make use of that data in future. So the thing does matter now. Thank you for the responses. Majority of you did, so that was good. So did your consent form inform the participants about future uses of data such as publications and data archiving? So that that is really great that a majority of you uh, have informed the participants about the future uses of data. Because um, every now and then the data that is being deposited with us, they, they, we, we see uh, problems in the consent forms uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, because people either they put statements such as um, the data will not be shared outside the research team or it will be destroyed or such statements preclude data sharing. So it is always good. It's not a legal requirement to inform the participants about data archiving uh, because uh, you are doing research in the public interest in the UK, but it's an ethical obligation that participants should know the future uses of their data. And the last one, are you collecting personal information or have collected? If so, have you informed the participants how it will be processed, stored, and for how long? Because that's another important thing, I, I think. So some of you are not sure which is uh, fair enough. Some of you have not informed them. Um, yeah, so just bear in mind for your future projects and majority of you have informed them, which is really great. So thank you very much for your responses. Going back to the slides. So uh, consent can be gained in written or oral form. And the format of the consent depends on the kind of research. However, it is important that whatever format is used, written or verbal, it should be documented. You need to document how it has been gained, what information has been provided to the participants and what they have agreed to. And uh, uh, as I said, consent can be written or verbal. Both formats have advantages and disadvantages. For example, written consent has more solid legal ground. For example, participants have agreed to disclose confidential information and you have the evidence. And um, this is the form that is usually required by ethic committees. And most of all, it offers more protection for researchers as they have written evidence uh, available to them if asked. and. Uh, However, it is um, there are some instances uh, it cannot be used, for example, in illegal activities in the context of illegal activities. And um, on the other hand, verbal consents are best if recorded, uh, but sometimes it is hard to make all issues clear verbally and most of all, it can pose greater risk for researchers in regard to adequately proving participant consent. So because verbal consents may scare people from participating and have them think that they cannot withdraw their consent. Yeah, people do not remember. So um, if you have it in writing, that, that is considered a better. So typically, I, I, I'm sure you must be aware about the these uh, upcoming slides, but just for those people who 
who are not very familiar. Uh, written consent documentation includes an information sheet and a consent form signed by the participant. This division allows the background information to be as detailed as necessary while keeping the signature form short and concise. And um, information sheet should cover the following, for example, purpose of the research, what is involved in participating, benefits and risks involved, procedures for withdrawal, future uses of data such as storage, publishing, archiving, and um, also details of the research, uh, such as funding source, sponsor institution, name of project, contact details for researchers, and how to file a complaint if there is any. So these things needs to be there. While researchers need to make sure that consent form should uh, use simple language and should allow the participants to clearly respond to points such as they have read and understood information about the project. They have been given the opportunity to ask questions and they voluntarily agrees to participate in the project. They understand they, that they can withdraw at any time without giving reasons and without any penalty. And importantly, future uses uh, for example, publications, share and reuse of the data and signatures and dates of signing for the participant and the researcher should be there if you are planning to share the data. If personal information is collected, then best practice is to provide information about how personal information will be processed and stored and for how long. Procedures for maintaining confidentiality, whether real names will be used or not, if data will be anonymized, if so, how it should um, also state procedures for ensuring ethical use of the data, especially in the context of archiving and reuse. And um, if the GDPR applies, then further information needs to be provided in consent forms, such as the contact details of the data controller, um, here, the data controller is the entity that determines the reason for processing personal data. It could be a data protection officer, REO at your organization, or a researcher uh, themselves. And consent form should also state who will receive or have access to the personal data. It should also have a clear statement on the rights of the participants because participants can request to access their data um, they may ask for uh, corrections or even removal of their personal data. So these need to be communicated to the participants. Um, however, you may use some of these in the information sheet and some in the consent forms. Um, so please have a look at the UKDS model consent form where you can find detailed guidance along with the template to get a clear understanding. I, I have added a link at the last slide, which is about resources that are useful to you. So different methods can be used to obtain consent. Um, and ICO has recommended the following, for example, signing a consent statement on a paper form, ticking an opt-in box on paper or electronically, clicking an opt-in button or link online, selecting from equally prominent yes, no options, choosing technical settings or preference um, dashboard settings, or even responding to an email requesting consent and answering yes to a clear oral consent request. You can see that um, all of these methods fulfill the conditions that uh, are required for the consent, um, such as clear affirmative action and um, it, it's not being infer inferred from silence predict boxes or inactivity. So, so fulfilling all those conditions, these methods. So this section is about when to seek consent. So yeah, obtaining consent for participation in research or for future uses such as publications or for sharing and reuse of data can be a one of occurrence or an ongoing process. Both approaches have disadvantages and dis, uh, advantages. Um, for example, one of consent is used for taking part in the research project only once, as the name implies. And um, it is 
simple and the least hassle to participants, but there are disadvantages such as sometimes research outputs are not known in advance and the participants will not know about all the information they will be contributing to. Um, while on the other hand, process consent is requested continuously throughout the research project. It ensures active consent, but it may not get, um, you may not get all consent needed before losing contact and it can be repet repetitive for participants. So yeah, it, it however, it depends on the research project, what sort of consent you need, whether it's a one-off or you need a process consent. There are situations where specific considerations are needed when seeking consent. However, it is beyond the scope of this session to go through all of these. Um, you can find detailed information on these on our website. I have added a link at the bottom of the slide. So uh, the information or guidance does cover these specific areas if you want to have a look uh, in terms of the consent. Sometimes researchers are faced with the challenges when sharing or archiving data, especially if the data contains personal information and cannot be anonymized. And at the time of data collection, they do not consider obtaining consent for future uses of data specifically, um, ar archiving and sharing. So in that case, they may consider retrospective consent, um, which is sometimes possible, but uh, if participants cannot be traced, depositing the data in a repository will need to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis um, to identify whether it is appropriate to share it or possibly present it to the ethics board for review and decision. So the assessment is made based on the risk, harm, benefits, disclosive nature of the data, and so on. In addition, Sometimes researchers are faced with the challenges when participants ask to withdraw from the research. This is challenging, especially if the data has been collected at archive for future use. This needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis as well, but it is best if researchers consider this in advance and provide information about this in the information sheet or consent form. Sometimes there may not be a problem um, as the personal data is not shared or it may be anonymized, but sometimes in qualitative studies where there are very less participants, it could be very damaging. Um, so researchers can consider for dealing with participants wishing to withdraw. They, they could seek a meeting and explain to the participant the cost of this to the project, or they could discuss whether some of the data could be kept. Um, for example, if data can be completely anonymized or part of the data uh, is anonymized and something, some sorts of, um, some discussion of this sort. So research, uh, there, there are circumstances where no form of consent can be obtained. <clears throat> These situations are exceptional and will need case by case review as well and clear arguments to satisfy the requirement of ethic review boards. And um, there can be varied reasons why consent is not possible. For example, limited capacity may prevent a person from being fully informed. Data may have already been collected for another purpose that did not require consent, such as government administrative data or consent may not be technically feasible in some very large scale projects. You, you can get detailed information regarding this on our website. And the link to this um, is, uh, on the resources slide at the end. And um, in addition, uh, participants' perception, or if the sample comprises of children and vulnerable, vulnerable people, patients, poor awareness of their rights, um, a failure to provide adequate information, absence of consideration of participants' educational level, or even a cultural background, time con constraints and use of unclear language, all of these, um, are challenging for the researchers. So uh, in terms of data sharing, if these things are not communicated clearly, participants are skeptical of confidentiality issues. So always try to think carefully and always uh, be open to discussions. So 
Now I'll show you some real examples from the constant firms in this section uh, that depositors have used to deposit their data with us. But before that, um, I would say you can break down the information that goes into the consent form into three key areas. Information related to participation in the research, how the information collected will be used by the researcher, and information about future uses by the researcher or by other researchers if data would be shared. So yeah, in breaking down in three parts would be very useful. This is an extract of the UK data service uh, model consent form. And this section is about taking part um, in the study. Uh, these, um, I think two or three upcoming slides, they are the screenshots of our template uh, of the model consent form. And you will see that we have in our template broken down the information into those three key areas that I, I have just gone through. So this section is about taking part in the study. I will let you read it quickly. What you need to cover in that. Yeah. You can see that it has captured several aspects such as participants have read and understand the information, voluntary participation, some um, sentences, sentences on withdrawal um, from the research. And it also explains what they have to do if they want to withdraw, how information is being collected, or if there are any potential risks. So this second section is uh, about the use of information or data being collected. It also addresses the confidentiality aspect by asking what can or cannot be shared. So this third section is about informing the participants about future use and reuse of the information. You can see that it does mention that, uh, uh, that the information where the data will be deposited um, and if so, in which form, whether it is anonymized or if available under restrictions. So all sorts of information for this. This is an important section. If you plan to share your data, you, you need, ethically, you need to inform the participants what, what you're going to do with their information. So these are some um, real example extracts that have been used uh, in the researches that have been uh, deposited, uh, the data that has been deposited with us. I just let you read this quickly. The, the first extract focuses on two things, future uses of data and also very nicely uh, presenting all forms of um, uh, data. For example, data, um, audio recording, transcript, photographs. So they, they do keep in mind the granularity aspect of in the consent form. So that is a nice example if you have um, several formats in your data set. And in the second example, participants are being informed about the future uses such as a report, content of a website, archiving, reuse by other researchers. And here you can see that they have uh, also been told that they may be contacted again if their personal data or a quote or a photograph will be used, which shows an active or uh, process content, which is also nice. 
to let them know about future contacts. Here again, uh, providing information regarding archiving, who will have access to the data and on what conditions. And it also states the reuse purpose. And um, both of these extracts show how confidentiality can be maintained, how personal data will be stored, who can have access to it, and on what conditions and where it will be stored. Uh, I just let you read it quickly. So this is an example from Health Research Authority. And um, I think it's a very nice example about a blood donation study. I'm not sure how many of you are health researchers, but this may give you an idea how to present information to the participants. Here, they have combined information sheet and consent form in one document. And um, on the title page, they have added consent statements addressing most of the conditions we have gone through. And um, they have added some information around why is their study needed? What does taking part in the study involve? Why have I been invited and am I eligible? Do I, do I have to take part? What should I do if I want to take part? So just letting them know what it involves what happens during my next donation visit, what will happen to my blood sample. So you can take it as what will happen to my information that is being collected, what happens immediately after I enroll. So a very detailed information sheet or consent form. So what happens next? Are there any benefits? Are there any risks? How do I withdraw if I want to do so? Who will be able to use my information? Can I know the results obtained? So who is organizing and funding the study? Who has approved the study? What will happen if an invention is made using my sample? So you can also, again, take it in terms of um, publications or something like that. What happens if something goes wrong? How? Do I contact if I have any concerns? So yeah, they, they, it's a very comprehensive um, information sheet and consent form. So yeah, that 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 is, uh, I think, a nice uh, way to provide comprehensive information to the participants. I have added a link here as well as on the resources slide. So. Yeah, next, I would like you to go to Padlet uh, using this QR code and Gail would put a link in the chat um, where I have uh, added some consent form statements that appears in real consent forms. And you just need to assess statements. What are your thoughts on that? It's anonymous, you can add comments. So I have seen some comments for the second one. I agree to participate in this study and to have any audio and visual data used for analysis reports and presentations. So someone has written me to make it clear what reports, what presentations and what analysis, that's, that's very right. No choice to let just the audio or visual data be used. Yes, for how long? How is it being shared, restricted, or open access? That's exactly that. 
So in terms of this, uh, I will go one by one. So I'm just reading the comments on the second statement. I have finished reading the comments and um, I would say that depending on the project, it may be more appropriate to break this down into subcategories, offering the participant more choice, such as to have their data used for analysis and reports, but not in presentations. And this statement also does not explain whether the data will be uh, directly identified them or um, be a direct quotation from them. It is therefore important for the information sheet to provide more context and guidance here. So that's right. I'll move to here. I think there are more responses for the statement number three. Yes, that is a very problematic statement. Uh, in accordance with the requirement uh, of our university research ethics committee, data from this project will be destroyed after funding concludes. Time frame, need to provide dates, funding finish. Yeah. So more responses related to time frame, give specific date health. Yeah, publication. That's that's right. Great. Thank you for your responses. Yeah, it, it, exactly. This is a problematic statement. Uh, for example, what data? Do we mean data which will be contained in the research data set? What about funder requirements to deposit and share data if there, there are any funders requirement? Here again, it is about providing clarity to participants around which data will be deleted specifically and which will be archived. There is no information. This statement shows that all the data will be destroyed. And it precludes data sharing. So this is very problematic if you plan to share data. I'll move on to statement number four. I understand that only the research team will have access to data I will provide. Yeah, it's it's very vague, very general. It, it is general, but um, what about data sharing or archiving? If you if your funder requires it, this sort of statement preclude data sharing that no one can have access to your data, and it is vague in a sense. Maybe they mean uh, by personal data, the personal data they obtained uh, because names and email addresses or phone numbers are in the consent form. So, do they mean that? So, it it is very general, very vague statements, and it does preclude data sharing. Yeah, that's right. All the responses to statement number three, they, they are fantastic. So I move on to statement number five. I understand that the information provided will be used in a report and other publications likely to be read by other parents of young children and by teachers and others working on educational issues. Yeah. Who to be shared at what extent personally identifiable data explicit here yeah, needs to be explicit. Is it anonymized? Yes, that's right. So what message is this statement trying to convey? Can we provide more clarity about specifically um, what information will be used in the report? Do we mean personal details, direct quotes, and so on? So this is a bit vague statement. Uh, moving on to statement number one now. Any information I give will be used for research only and will not be used for any other purpose. Yeah, so again, a problematic statement for in terms of future uses of data. Yes, all the responses, yeah, comments very, very specific and correct.
Yeah, thank you very much um, for participating in this Padlet, and I hope it is useful for you to assess. So, yeah, this uh, sort of statements needs to be avoided in the consent form. Um, for example, any information that I give will be used for research only and will not be used for any other purpose. I understand that only the research team will have access to the information I provide and data will be destroyed after so many years. So you need to be specific which data. Is it personal data which is not going to be archived and um, retention policies depends on your organization. So yeah, be very specific, be very careful in terms of uh, using statements in the consent form or even information sheet. What you write there, it can easily preclude data sharing. And that is a problem if you are required by your funder to share the data. So the takeaway message is do not collect personal data if it is not essential, because if you do not collect personal data, then data protection regulations does not apply. And the second important thing is indicate clearly in a consent form where the consent is being asked for processing their personal data and where it is being asked for taking part in the research. As you have seen in those extracts, it should be granular. And always keep consent forms under constant review and always try to indicate the future uses, especially archiving if you plan to share the data. So these are the resources uh, where you can find useful information and it has uh, uh, our, the template uh, that we advise to use the UKDS model consent form example information sheet. And then there is a consent form visit by Daria. That's, that's um, interesting and useful as well. And the example consent form I have shown you from Health Research Authority and some information related to uh, regulating access to data and then a guide to good uh, data management and sharing research data.